the fifth, Napoleon said Marchand for me at about nine o'clock, was introduced by the back door into his bedroom, a description of which I shall endeavor to give as minutely and as correctly as possible. It was about 14 feet by 12 and 10 or 11 feet in height. The walls were lined with brown nankeen, bordered and edged with common green bordering paper and destitute of surface. Two small windows without pulleys, looking towards the camp of the 53rd Regiment, one of which was thrown up and fastened by a piece of notched wood. Window curtains of white long cloth, a small fireplace, a shabby grate, and fire irons to match with a paltry mantelpiece of wood painted white upon which stood a small marble bust of his son. Above the mantelpiece hung the portrait of Marie Louise and four or five of young Napoleon, one of which was embroidered by the hands of the mother. A little more to the right hung also a miniature picture of the Empress Josephine, and to the left was suspended the alarm chamber watch of Frederick the Great, obtained by Napoleon at Potsdam, while on the right the consular watch engraved with the cipher B, hung by a chain of the plaited hair of Marie Louise from a pin stuck in the nankeen lining. The floor was covered with a second-hand carpet, which had once decorated the dining room of a lieutenant of the St. Helena Artillery. In the right-hand corner was placed the little plain iron camp bedstead with green silk curtains, upon which its master had reposed on the fields of Marengo and Austerlitz. Between the windows there was a paltry second-hand chest of drawers and an old bookcase with green blinds stood on the left of the door leading to the next apartment. Four or five cane-bottomed chairs painted green were standing here and there about the room. Before the back door there was a screen covered with nankeen and between that and the fireplace an old-fashioned sofa covered with white long cloth upon which reclined Napoleon, clothed in his white morning gown, white loose trousers and stockings all in one, a checkered red madras upon his head, and his shirt collar opened without a cravat. His air was melancholy and troubled. Before him stood a little round table, with some books at the foot of which lay in confusion upon the carpet, a heap of those which he had already perused, and at the foot of the sofa facing him was suspended a portrait of the Empress Marie Louise, with her son in her arms. In front of the fireplace stood Las Casas, with his arms folded over his breast and some papers in one of his hands. Of all the former magnificence of the once mighty Emperor of France, nothing was present except a superb wash stand containing a silver basin and water jug of the same metal in the left hand corner napoleon after a few questions of no importance asked me in both french and italian in the presence of countless casas the following questions you know that it was in consequence of my application that you were appointed to attend upon me. Now I want to know from you precisely and truly as a man of honor in what situation you conceive yourself to be, whether as my surgeon, as Monsieur Mango was, or the surgeon of a prison ship and prisoners, whether you have orders to report every trifling occurrence or illness or what I say to you to the governor. Answer me candidly. What situation do you conceive yourself to be in? I replied, as your surgeon, and to attend upon you and your surgeon and your suite, I have received no other orders than to make an immediate report in case of your being taken seriously ill in order to have promptly the advice and assistance of other physicians. First obtaining my consent to call in others to meditate, is it not so? I answered that I would certainly obtain his previous consent. He then said, if you were appointed as surgeon to a prison and to report my conversations to the governor, who I take to be un capo di spioni, a captain of spies, I would never see you again. Do not, continued he, on my replying that I was placed about him as a surgeon and by no means as a spy. Suppose that I take you for a spy. On the contrary, I have never had the least occasion to find fault with you. 
and I have a friendship for you and an esteem for your character, a greater proof of which I could not give you than asking you candidly your own opinion of your situation, as you, being an Englishman and paid by the English government, might perhaps be obliged to do what I asked. I replied as before said, and that in my professional capacity, I did not consider myself to belong to any particular country. If I am taken seriously ill, said he, then acquaint me with your opinion and ask my consent to call in others. This governor, during the few days that I was melancholy and had a mental affliction in consequence of the treatment I received, which prevented me from going out in order that I might not ennuyé, weary others with my afflictions, wanted to send his physician to me under the pretext of inquiring after my health, I desired Bertrand to tell him that I had not sufficient confidence in his physician to take anything from his hands, that if I were really ill, I would send for you in whom I have confidence, but that a physician was of no use in such cases, and that I only wanted to be left alone. I understand that he proposed an officer should enter my chamber to see me. If I did not stir out any person, continued he, with much emotion, who endeavors to force his way to my apartment, shall be a corpse the moment he enters it. If he ever eats bread or meat again, I am not Napoleon. This I am determined on. I know that I shall be killed afterwards, as what can one do against a camp? I have faced death too many times to fear it. Besides, I am convinced that this governor has been sent out by Lord Blank. I told him a few days ago that if he wanted to put an end to me, he would have a very good opportunity by sending somebody to force his way into my chamber, that I would immediately make a corpse of the first that entered, and that I should be, of course, dispatched. And he might write home to his government that Bonaparte was killed in a brawl. I also told him to leave me alone and not to torment me with his hateful presence. I have seen Prussians, Tartars, Cossacks, Kalmyks, but never before in my life have I beheld so ill-favored and so forbidding a countenance. He carries the blank imprint on his face. I endeavored to convince him that the English ministry would never be capable of what he supposed and that he was not the character of the nation. I had reason to complain of the admiral, said he, but though he treated me roughly, he never behaved in such a manner as this Prussian. A few days ago, he in a manner insisted upon seeing me when I was undressed and prey to melancholy in my chamber. The admiral never asked to see me a second time when it was intimated to him that I was unwell or undressed, as he well knew that though he did not go out, I was still to be found. After this, he mentioned his apprehensions of being afflicted with an attack of gout. I recommended to him to take much more exercise. What can I do, replied he, in this execrable island where you cannot ride a mile without being wet through an island that even the English themselves complain of, though used to humidity, he concluded by making some severe remarks upon the governor's conduct in having his aide-de-camp and secretary round the shops, forbidding the shopkeepers to give the French credit under pain of severe punishment. The sixth had some more conversation with Napoleon upon the same subject as yesterday, which commenced by my submitting to him that according to the strict letter of the conversation of yesterday, it would be impossible for me to reply to any question addressed to me relative to him or to his affairs, whether made by the governor or anyone else which he must be aware was in my situation impossible. Moreover, that I had been from the time of my arrival and was then frequently employed as a medium of communication to the authorities of the island, which I hoped I had executed to his satisfaction. He replied, are you to be my surgeon or surgeon Dungeller of a galley? Are you expected to report what you observe or hear? I answered, I am your surgeon and not a spy, and one in whom I hope you may place confidence. I am not a surgeon, Dungeller, nor do I consider it imperative on me to report anything which is not contrary to my allegiance as a British officer. 
I also endeavored to explain that I would regulate my conduct with respect to his conversations by the rules which existed to that effect among gentlemen. And as I would do, were I attached in a similar capacity to an English nobleman, but that total silence was out of my power. If he wished me to preserve any communication with the governor or with any other English persons on the island, he replied that all he wanted of me was to act as a gallant tuomo, gentlemen. And as you would do, were you surgeon to Lord St. Vincent, I do not mean to bind you to silence or to prevent you from repeating any bavadage trifle you may hear me say, but I want to prevent you from allowing yourself to be cajoled and made a spy of unintentionally on your part by this governor. After that, to your God, your duty is to be paid to your own country and sovereign, and you're next to your patience. During the short interview that this governor had with me in my bedchamber, continued he, one of the first things which he proposed was to send you away and to take his own surgeon in your place, since he repeated twice, and so earnest was he to gain his object, that although I gave him a most decided refusal when he was going out, he turned about and again proposed it. I never saw such a hard countenance. He sat on a chair opposite to my sofa, and on the little table between us there was a cup of coffee, his physiognomy made such an unfavorable impression on me that I thought his looks had poisoned it, and I ordered Marchand to throw it out of the window. I could not have swallowed it for the world. Countless causes who entered Napoleon's room a few minutes after the departure of the governor told me that the emperor had said to him, oh My God, he has a very bad countenance. I dare say so, but one should not venture to drink a cup of coffee. If he had been near it alone... For an instant, the twelve, a proclamation was issued yesterday by Sir Hudson Lowe, prohibiting any person from receiving or being the bearer of any letters or communications from General Bonaparte, the officers of his suite, his followers or servants of any description, or to deliver any of them under pain of being arrested immediately and dealt with accordingly. The fourteenth saw Napoleon in his dressing room. He complained of being affected with catarrhal symptoms, the cause of which I attributed to his having walked out in the wet with very thin shoes and recommended him to wear galoshes, which he ordered Marchand to provide. I have promised, added he, to see a number of people today, and though I am indisposed, shall do so. Just at this moment, some of the visitors came close to the window of his dressing room, which was open, tried to put aside the curtain and peep in. Napoleon shut the window and asked some questions about Lady Moira, and observed, the governor sent an invitation to Bertrand Fort General Bonaparte to come to Plantation House to meet Lady Moira. I told Bertrand to return no answer to it. If he really wanted me to see her, he would have put Plantation House in the limits. But to send such an invitation, knowing that I must go in charge of a guard if I wish to avail myself of it, was an insult. If he had sent word that Lady Moira was sick, fatigued, or pregnant, I should have gone to see her, though I think that under all the circumstances she might have come to see me or Madame Bertrand or Montalon, as she was free and unshackled. The first sovereigns in the world have not been ashamed to pay me a visit. It appears, added he, that this governor was with Blue Sure, and is the writer of some official letters to your government descriptive of part of the operations of 1814. I pointed them out to him the last time I saw him and asked him, Is this you, sir? He replied, Yes. I told him that they were full of falsehoods and foolishness. He shrugged up his shoulders, appeared confused, and replied, I believe that I saw that. If, continued he, those letters were the only accounts he sent, he betrayed his country. Count Petran came in and announced that several persons had arrived to see him, besides those who had received appointments for the day, amongst other names. That of Arbusnot was mentioned. Napoleon asked me who he was. I answered that I believed him to be a brother to the person who had been ambassador to Constantinople. Ah, yes, 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 said Napoleon with a slight smile when Sebastiani was there. You may say that I shall receive them. Have you conversed much with the governor's physician, said Napoleon. I replied in the affirmative, adding that he was the chief of the medical staff, but not attached to the governor as his body physician. What sort of man is he? Does he look like an honest man or a man of talent? I replied that his appearance was very much in his favor and that he was considered to be a man of talent and of science. 16th. 
Sir Hudson Lowe had an interview of about half an hour with Napoleon, which did not appear to be satisfactory. Saw Napoleon walking in the garden in a very thoughtful manner, a few minutes subsequent to the governor's departure, and gave to him the Dictionnaire de Girouette, the Dictionary of Weathercocks, and a few newspapers. After he had asked me from whom I had procured them, he said, Here has been this torturing executioner tell him that i never want to see him and that i wish he may not come again to annoy me with his hateful presence let him never again come near me unless it is with orders to dispatch me he will then find my breast ready for the blow but until then let me be free of his odious countenance i cannot accustom myself to it the 17th napoleon is in very good spirits demanded what the news was. I informed him that the ladies he had received a few days before were highly delighted with his manners, especially as from what they had read and heard, they had been prepossessed with opinions of a very different nature. Ah, said he laughing, I suppose that they imagined I was some ferocious horned animal. Some conversations occurred touching what Sir Robert Wilson had written respecting him about Jaffa, Captain Wright, and I observed that as those assertions had never been fully contradicted, they were believed by a number of English. Bear, replied Napoleon, those calumnies will fall of themselves, especially now that there are so many English in France who will soon find out that they are all falsehoods. Were Wilson himself not convinced of the untruth of the statements which he had once believed, do you think that he would have assisted Lavalette to escape him out of prison? The 19th. Napoleon is in very good humor, told him that the late governor of Java, Mr. Raffles, and his staff had arrived on their way to England and were very desirous of having the honor of paying their respects to him. What kind of man is this governor, replied Mr. Urmston, informed me that he is a very fine fellow and possessed of great learning and talents. Well, then said he, I shall see them in two or three hours when I'm dressed. This governor, said he, is... A simpleton. He asked Bertrand the other day if he, Bertrand, ever asked any of the passengers bound to England whether they intended to go to France, as if he had done so, he must not continue such a practice. Bertrand replied that he certainly had, and moreover had begged of some to tell his relations that they were in good health. But, says this imbecile, you must not do so. Why, says Bertrand, has not your government permitted me to write as many letters as I like? And can any government deny me the liberty of speaking? Bertrand, continued he, ought to have replied that galley slaves and prisoners under sentence of death were permitted to inquire after their relations. He then observed how unnecessary and vexatious it was to require that an officer should accompany him should he be desirous of visiting the interior of the island. It is all right, continued he, to keep me away from the town and the seaside. I would never desire to approach either the one or the other. All that is necessary for my security is to guard well the sea borders of this rock. Let him place his piquets round the island, close by the sea, and a communication with each other, which he might easily do with the number of men he has, and it would be impossible for me to escape. Can he not, moreover, put a few horsemen in motion? When he knows I'm going out, cannot he please them on the hills or where he likes without letting me know anything about it? I will never appear to see them. Cannot he do this without obliging me to tell Poppleton that I want to ride out? Not that I have any objection to Poppleton. I love a good soldier of any nation, but I will not do anything which may lead people to imagine that I am a prisoner. I have been forced here, contrary to the law of nations. I will never acknowledge their right in detaining me. My asking an officer to accompany me would be a tacit acknowledgement of it. I have no intention to attempt an escape. Escape, though I have not given my word of honor not to try, neither will I ever give it, as that would be, acknowledging myself a prisoner, which I will never do. Cannot they impose additional restrictions when ships arrive, and above all, not allow any ship to sail until my actual presence is ascertained without inflicting such useless and because useless vexatious 
restrictions. It is necessary for my health that I should ride seven or eight leagues daily, but I will not do so with an officer or a guard over me. It has always been my maximum that a man shows more real courage in supporting and resisting the calamities and misfortunes which befall him than by making away with himself. That is the action of a losing gamester or a ruined spendthrift, and it is a want of courage instead of a proof of it. Your government will be mistaken if they imagine that by seeking every means to annoy me, such as sending me here, depriving me of all communication with my nearest and dearest relatives, so that I am ignorant if one of my blood exists, isolating me from the world, imposing useless and vexation restrictions, which are daily getting worse sending, the scum of mankind is keepers. They will weary out my patience and induce me to commit suicide. Oh, they are mistaken. Even if I ever had entertained a thought of the kind, the idea of the gratification it would afford them would prevent me from completing it. That palace, said he laughing, which they say they have sent out for me. Is so much money thrown into the sea. I would rather that they had sent me 400 volumes of books and all their furniture and houses in the first place. It will require some years to build it, and before that time I shall be no more. All must be done by the labor of those poor soldiers and sailors. I do not wish it. I do not wish to incur the hatred of those poor fellows who are already sufficiently miserable by having been sent to this detestable place and harassed in the manner they are. They will load me with execration, supposing me to be the author of all their hardships, and perhaps may wish to put an end to me. I observed that no English soldier would become an assassin. He interrupted me by saying, I have no reason to complain of the English soldiers or sailors. On the contrary, they treat me with every respect. I even appear to feel for me. He then spoke of some English officers more, said he was a brave soldier, an excellent officer, and a man of talent. He made a few mistakes, which were probably inseparable from the difficulties with which he was surrounded, and caused, perhaps, by his information having misled him. This elogium he repeated more than once and observed that he had commanded the reserve in Egypt, where he had behaved very well and displayed talent. I remarked that Moore was always in front of the battle and was generally unfortunate enough to be wounded. Ah, uh, said he, it is necessary sometimes. He died gloriously. He died like a soldier. Minu was a man of courage, but no soldier. You ought not to have taken Egypt. If Clay Bear had lived, you would never have conquered it, an army without artillery or cavalry. The Turks signified nothing. Clipper was an irreparable loss to France and to me. He was a man of the brightest talents and the greatest bravery. I have composed a history of my own campaigns in Egypt and of yours while I was at the Briars, but I want the monitors for the dates. The conversation then turned upon French naval officers. Villeneuve said he, when taken prisoner and brought to England, was so much grieved at his defeat that he studied anatomy on purpose to destroy himself. For this purpose, he bought some anatomical plates of the heart and compared them with his own body in order to ascertain the exact situation of that organ. On his arrival in France, I ordered that he should remain at Rennes and not proceed to Paris. Villeneuve, afraid of being tried by a court-martial for disobedience of orders and consequently losing the fleet, for I had ordered him not to sail or to engage the English determined to destroy himself and accordingly took his plates of the heart and compared them with his breast. Exactly in the center of the plate, he made a mark with a large pin, then fixed the pin as near as he could judge in the same spot in his own breast, shoved into the head, penetrated his heart and expired. When the room was open, he was found dead, the pin in his breast and a mark in the plate corresponding with the wound in his breast. He need not have done it, continued he, as he was a brave man, though possessed of no talent. Bad Ray, said he, whom you took in the Rivoli, was a very brave and good officer. When I went to Egypt, I gave directions after I had disembarked and had taken Alexandria in a few hours to sound for a passage for the fleet of Venetian 64. I had a 50-gun ship, I think he said, got in, which I suppose you have seen there, but it was reported that the large ships of the line could not. I ordered Barret to sound. He reported to me that there was a sufficiency of water in one part of the channel. Brias, on the contrary, said there was not enough of water for the 80-gun ship. Barry insisted that there was. In the meantime, I had advanced in the country after the Mamelukes 
All communication with the army from that town by messengers was cut off by the Bedouins who took or killed them all. My orders did not arrive or I would have obliged Brias to enter. For you must know that I had the command of the fleet as well as the army. In the meantime, Nelson came and destroyed Brias and his fleet. But what I have learned from you, I see that Barry was right. As you saw the Tigra and Canopus enter. After this, he made some observations upon the island. Such said he is a deplorable state of this rock. That the absence of actual want or starvation is considered as a great blessing. Poniatowski went down to Robinson's the other day where they said to him, Oh, how happy you must be to have fresh meat every day to dinner. Oh, if we could enjoy that, how happy we would be. Is this a place, continued he, fit for any person who has been accustomed to live amongst human beings? The 28th. Napoleon asked me if I had not had a very large party to dinner yesterday. I replied, a few. How many of you were drunk? I said, none. Bah, bah, what none? Why, they could not have done any honor to your entertainment. Was not Captain Ross a little gay? I replied, Captain Ross is always gay. He laughed at this and said, Ross is a very fine fellow, and the ship's company are very happy in having such a captain. I saw, said he, that poor clergyman Jones. They have used that poor man most cruelly in depriving him of his employment for the sake of his family. If not for himself, they ought not to have superseded him. He's a good man, is he not? I replied that he was a man of good heart, but that he was accused of being too fond of meddling with what did not concern him. I told him that news had arrived that the Queen of Portugal was dead and also that a French frigate had arrived at Rio de Janeiro to demand one of the king's daughters in marriage for the Duke de Berry. The queen said he has been mad for a long time and the daughters are all ugly. 29th, a ship arrived from England, went to town, saw the governor, and on my return went to Napoleon, who is playing at nine pence with his generals in the garden. I told, by desire of the governor, that a bill concerning him had been brought into Parliament to enable ministers to detain him in St. Helena and to provide the necessary sums of money for his maintenance. He asked if it had been met with opposition. I replied, scarcely any. Brougham, or Burdett, said he, did they make any? I replied, I have not seen the papers, but I believe that Mr. Brougham said something. Gave him, oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a very old book. Some French newspapers, which the Admiral had given me before he had read them. Who gave you those papers? The Admiral. What, for me? With some surprise? told me to give them to Bertrand, but in reality, they were intended for you. After some conversation, he asked me to procure the Morning Chronicle, the Globe, or any of the opposition or neutral papers. June 7th, breakfasted with Napoleon in the garden, had a long medical argument with him in which he maintained that his practice, in case of malady, used to eat nothing, drink plenty of barley water and no wine, and ride for several or seven or eight leagues to promote perspiration was much better than mine. Some conversations took place about the mode of solemnizing marriage, in which I said that in England, when a Protestant and Catholic were married, it was necessary that the ceremony should be performed first by a Protestant clergyman and afterwards by a Roman Catholic priest. That is wrong, said he. Marriage ought to be a civil contract, and on the parties going before a magistrate in the presence of witnesses and entering into an engagement, they should be considered as man and wife. This is what I caused to be done in France. If they wished it, they might go to the church afterwards and get a priest to repeat the ceremony, but this ought not to be considered as indispensable. It was always my maxim that those religious ceremonies should never be above the laws. I also ordained that marriage is contracted by French subjects in foreign countries when performed according to the laws of those countries should be valid on the return of the parties to France. The 15th. Napoleon at breakfast in his bath, a little sliding table was put over the bath upon which the dishes were placed. I told him that Warden had found a book belonging to him which was supposed to have been lost on board of the Northumberland. Ah, Warden, the fine man, how is he? Why does he not come and see me? 
I should be glad to see him. How is the chief physician? I said that he would feel highly honored by being presented to him if you would consent to see him as a private person and not as a physician. As you say that he is a gentleman, I shall see him. You may introduce him to me in the garden any day you like. Have you seen the Lady Lowe? I have been told that she's a graceful and fine woman. I replied that I had heard so, and also that she was very lively. It is a pity, said he, that she cannot bestow a portion of her wit and grace upon her husband. As for the public character, I never saw a man so deficient in both. He asked me a number of questions about London, of which I had sent him a history, which had been made a present to me by Captain Ross. He appeared to be well acquainted with the contents of the book though he had not had it in his possession many days, described the plates and tried to repeat several of the cries. Said that if he had been king of England, he would have made a grand street on each side of the Thames and another from St. Paul's to the river. The conversation afterwards turned upon the manner of living in France and England. Which eats the most, said he, the Frenchman or the Englishman? I said, I think the Frenchman. I don't believe it, said Napoleon. I replied that the French, though they nominally make two meals a day, really have four. Only two, said he. I replied, they take something at nine in the morning, at eleven, at four, and at seven or eight in the evening. I, said he, never eat more than twice daily. You English always eat four or five times a day. Your cookery is more healthy than ours. Your soup is, however, very bad. Nothing but bread, pepper, and water. You drink an enormous quantity of wine. I said not so much is, as is supposed by the French. Why, replied he, Piantowski, who died sometimes in camp with the officers of the 53rd, said that they drink by the hour, that after the cloth is removed, they pay so much an hour and drink as much as they like, which sometimes lasts until four o'clock in the morning. I said, so far from the truth is it that some of the officers do not drink wine more than twice a week and that on days in which strangers are permitted to be invited, there is a third of a bottle put on for each member that drinks wine and when that is exhausted, another third is put on and so on. Members only pay in proportion to what they drink. He appeared surprised with this explanation and observed how easily a stranger having only an imperfect knowledge of the language was led to give a wrong interpretation to the customs and actions of other nations. 17th. Told Napoleon that the Newcastle frigate was in sight with the new admiral. He desired me to fetch my glass and point her out to him. Found him on my return on his way to the stables. Pointed out the vessel beating up to windward. Shortly afterwards, Warden came up and Napoleon invited me to breakfast with him and to bring Warden and Lieutenant Blood with me. At breakfast, some conversation took place about the Abbe de Pratt and about some of the absurd falsehoods detailed in the quarterly review respecting his conduct while at Briars. We repeated to him. That will amuse the public, replied Napoleon. Warden observed that all Europe was very anxious to know his opinion of Lord Wellington as a general. To this he made no reply, and the question was not repeated. Three commissioners arrived in the new castle, Count Balmain for Russia, Baron Sturmer for Austria, accompanied by the Baroness's wife, Marquis de Montchenu for France, with Captain Gore, his aide-de-camp, an Austrian botanist, also accompanied Baron Sturmer. The 18th told Napoleon that I had been to town and that the commissioners for Russia, France, and Austria had arrived. Have you seen any of them? Yes, I saw the French commissioner. What sort of a man is he? He is an old emigrant named the Marquis of Montchenu, extremely fond of talking, but his looks are not against him. While I was standing in a group of officers on the terrace opposite the Admiral's house, he came out and addressing himself to me said in French, if you make any of you speak French, for the love of God, make it known to me, for I do not speak a word of English. I have arrived here to finish my days amongst those rocks, pointing to Ladder Hill, and I cannot speak a word of the language. Napoleon laughed very heartily at this and repeated, Bivar, imbecile, several times. 
what folly it is, said he, to send those commissioners out here. Without charge or responsibility, they will have nothing to do but walk about the streets and creep up the rocks. The Prussian government has displayed more judgment and saved their money. I told him that Drouot had been acquitted, which pleased him much. Of Drouot's talents and virtues, he spoke in the highest terms and observed that by the laws of France, he could not be punished for his conduct. The 20th Rear Admiral, Sir Putney Malcolm, Captain Maynell, the flag captain, and some other naval officers were presented to Napoleon. The 21st saw Napoleon walking in the garden and went down towards him with a book that I had procured for him. After he had made some inquiries about the health of Mrs. Peary, a respectable old lady whom I visited, he said that he had seen the new admiral. Ah, there's a man with the countenance, really pleasing, open, intelligent, frank, and sincere. There's the face of an Englishman. Truly, I felt as much pleasure in contemplating his countenance as I would in beholding that of a fine woman. Nothing dark, downcast, or dissimulating. His countenance bespeaks his heart, and I'm sure he's a good man. I never yet beheld a man of whom I so immediately formed a good opinion as of that fine soldier-like old man. He carries his head erect and speaks out openly and boldly what he thinks without being afraid to look you in the face at the same time. His physiognomy would make every person desirous of a further acquaintance and render the most suspicious confident in him. Some conversations now passed relative to the protest which had been made by Lord Holland against the bill for his attention. Napoleon expressed that opinion of Lord Holland, to which his talents and virtues so fully entitle him. He was highly pleased to find that the Duke of Sussex had joined his lordship in the protest and observed that when passions were calmed, the conduct of those two peers would be handed down to posterity with as much honor as that of the proposers of the measure would be loaded with ignominy. He asked several questions concerning the reductions of the English army and observed that it was absurd in the English government to endeavor to establish the nation as a great military power without having a population sufficiently numerous to afford the requisite number of soldiers to enable them to vie with the great or even the second-rate continental powers Why they neglected and seemed to undervalue the navy, which was the real force and bulwark of England. They will yet, said he, discover their error 